Hello and welcome to Shardcast, the Brandon Sanderson podcast. I'm Carrie, and joining me today is Eric. Hey, I'm Chaos. And Ian. Hey, I'm Weary Rider. And I'm Kay Chen. And today we have a very exciting special episode we, we, where we are joined with Ewan Johnson of Arcturus, who is doing the Stormlight VR experience, Escape from the Shattered Plains. Hi, how's it going? Glad to be here. Hopefully I did not mispronounce your name. <laughs> you did, actually. It's Ewan, but Ewan, that's sorry, okay. Yeah. I've lived my entire life with my name being pronounced many different ways. They <laughs> made fun of me before we got on this. I was saying it wrong, so no. Uh, that's you, okay. See, you and Carrie said it the exact same way. The, like, no, I don't remember, yes. so whatever. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm kind of used to it with everybody spelling my name wrong, so... There you go. Right. Um, okay. So... Yeah, we are here to talk about the VR experience, which comes out on March 2nd on yeah. Steam and Viveport. That is correct. Um, both for, for the Vive and for the Oculus Rift. Oh, it is for Ooh. the Oculus. Ooh, that's yeah. new news. That That is, so, uh, we did not know that before. That's exciting. Yeah. Um, so. so tell us a little bit about yourself, about the company, what you guys do. Sure. So Arcturus uh, is a XR production studio. We produce both VR and AR experiences uh, designed in the entertainment realm. Uh, so we like to, to build uh, VR and AR that merges interactivity with narrative. And that was one of the reasons why we were really intrigued by the Cosmere and the Stormlight Archive because it has such a great opportunity for, for VR with the magic systems and the interconnected worlds. Um, and so what, my, what I do is I'm the Chief Creative Officer uh, at Arcturus. So I work with our directors and with our, our producers to design and build our projects and then work with the entire creative team across multiple countries uh, to build the actual experiences. Cool. Awesome. Where, uh, where yeah, are so, all the studios at uh, uh, if you have multiple places? Absolutely. So we're distributed. Uh, I personally work out of Berkeley, California. Uh, my co-founder is based out of, of LA. Andy Stack um, works with a lot of our music productions down there. And then our core technology team is in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Devin Horseman is the third co-founder of Arcturus, um, and the majority of our team is there. Um, for this particular uh, project, um, the, the scope was fairly large, and so we did uh, partner with a studio in Malaysia called Streamline Studios to help with the overall production of this entire um, project. Wow, cool. So how, like, when was Arcturus founded? Like, how long have you been in this industry? So we founded Arcturus in uh, fall of 2016. Uh, we had been working together as a team on projects for a little over a year uh, before that, um, but decided to actually focus our, our energies and become Arcturus um, last year. And I've been working in VR production for since early 2015, uh, initially doing a lot of live action VR for uh, uh, people like the Denver Broncos, NBC Universal, all tie-ins to you know, existing shows or sports, a little bit of music, um, but really wanted to get back to my roots of, of narrative storytelling because my background's computer animation. Um, I originally joined Pixar in 1994 to design and build our, our cinematography department. What is computer animation cinematography? Uh, wow, so. that's almost as long that's as I've really been alive. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I, I was in computer animation for 23 years, both for DreamWorks Animation and Pixar. So um, Bugs Life, Toy Story, a How to Train Your Dragon, the Madagascar films, 
a few others in between. Uh, awesome. But really, really loving this balance of how do you use technology to tell stories and how do you use new mediums to tell stories. Yeah. And for me, that's where VR is right now. It's at this great place of like, we, we know what the potential is, and we're just discovering the, the potential solid deck. We just got to get there, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so, according to Variety, in May 2017, they reported that this experience would be uh, 15 minutes long. Uh, has that changed? Is that still about the length of the experience? Uh, obviously, it's not a full right. game, which is important for people to know. But right. Um, it has changed a little bit. Um, the average person can get through the experience in 15 minutes. What we're finding is that at the gameplay tends to be around 20 to 25 minutes long. We've had some people spend as long as 35 minutes going through the experience. We really tried in designing the experience to find the balance of a narrative temporal driven story with moments where you could explore and take things at, at your own pace. And so there's lots of opportunity when you're actually in the experience to wander, to observe, to examine, um, and to discover. There are some things you have to figure out in order to be able to advance the experience. Um, so it's not a, a fixed, this will take 15 minutes cool. every time. Yeah. And let's be honest, Cosmere fans, we're not going to be speed running this. No, we're no. going to be no. searching every inch of it. What are the boundaries exactly. of this zone? Yeah. What does this pixel mean? <laughs> exactly. Um, so what's the actual gameplay like? Like, you know, you've got walking VR experiences versus the teleporting ones. There was a video with lashing at some point. What will we be actually doing as we immerse ourselves into this experience? Sure. So we designed this to be a room scale experience, uh, but actually beyond room scale. So uh, you have the ability to wander, to look, to bend down and pick things up and, and examine it. Uh, you have teleportation built in so that you can explore the chasms. Um, the experience itself, you wake up in the midst of a high storm, you have to figure out how to, what's going on, how to survive that. Um, and after or, or a brief kind of passive, and it's not really passive, but brief introduction to the storm, you quickly find yourself knocked out. And when you wake up, you're inside of the chasm. And now you need to figure out how to escape. And so the gist of the experience is utilizing lashing, utilizing exploration to learn about the chasm and figure out your escape route. Um, but once you escape, you do end up encountering the Prashendi. And so you do have to end up fighting your way out from the Prashendi. Um, and maybe you'll succeed, but maybe you won't. And before you get a chance to really find out, your battle does get interrupted by a chasm team. So um, yeah. it's not enough to fight off a bunch of percent. You have to fight off the chasm fiend as well. Um, so you you get a little bit of a, a lot of different aspects of the lore. There are some adaptations we had to make to the lore to fit within the world of VR. Um, you have this very delicate balance of trying to be very true to Brandon's world and his universe and the lore that everyone is in love with, with what will actually be interesting and intriguing to experience inside of a headset. And so in particular, yes, we gave people the ability to lash objects and we gave people the ability to use that to even alter gravity and do wall walk walking. If we had left it at the very literal restrictions of lashing of like having to come into direct contact with an object in order to be able to lash the discovery process for people in the experience was a little bit too difficult 
And so we had to, to make adaptations along that lines. So for some people, it's going to feel a little bit more like telekinesis, but at its essence, we're trying to preserve the concept of lashing. Yeah. yeah and I think it's, you did um, talk about this, like it's an adaptation. It's not literally the books. There right. have to be allowances made for the medium. Right. And so there were some really interesting things like very early on, one of the core concepts that was really true to, to my heart was like really leveraging the idea of the gemstones and using those as like your, your collection of stormlight that you could then draw upon. And that's one of those places that we found when people were immersed in the experience and wandering around, having to keep track of how much stormlight they had and an inventory of gemstones and having to discover more gemstones turn into a little bit too much complexity for people to really enjoy the experience. They started to have to think about it as if it were a challenge in a game. And so sure. in this experience, you actually end up being charged with the stormlight for being caught in the storm. And you use that stormlight as you go and it can deplete. Um, but if you rest a little bit, you kind of get that energy back. And so that was a, an adaptation we made to allow the experience to flow a little bit better for people who are, are enjoying the narrative aspects of it. Right, because it, it's... I, I saw some YouTube comments uh, about... Uh, <laughs> the the trailer and obviously it'll look a lot better in vr but people are like oh this why they need to spend more time and make it a full game well it's it's that's not what it is you know a full right. game would be many many years of development and stuff exactly is that something that you would be inter uh, interested in doing eventually mm -hmm. depend we, we love this world and we love these stories and it would be beautiful to expand this out. Um, the, we, the initial impetus of doing this project and working with this project was really giving people that opportunity to first step into Brandon's world. Uh, DMG Entertainment, who we work closely with, is in the process of doing film adaptations. Yep. Um, and they felt rightly so, that this world was deserved more than just being, being given a couple pieces of concept art to communicate just how magical and wonderful it could be. Sure. Um, and we felt like that combination of a strong narrative structure with interactive elements could be a really rewarding experience to build. Um, so what this is, is this is a small slice that introduces you to the variety of life and experiences that are out there. Um, but we also felt like it was important to share with the fans. Once, once we saw just how compelling it was to be in this world, and uh, we had to share. Right, and you didn't need to do that. It could have just been an internal DMG right. thing. It didn't exactly. need to be announced. Yeah. So we, in one of the preview trailers, we got to meet Syl, which is right. very exciting. Are there any other characters that we get to meet? Um, Syl is your primary interaction. Um, much like in the books, she serves both as kind of your guide and, and your, not your tutor, but your, your helper explaining the world. I mean, yeah. you know, giving people the background. Right. Um, you obviously end up fighting the Prashendi, so you do encounter er, er, them as well as the Chasm Fiend. There are a few other creatures in the Chasm. You, you encounter a lonely Chull who got swept down into the Chasms. Um, and uh, you, you should really bef befriend him. Um, it's, oh, it's worth it. Um, I was okay. just going to ask if you could befriend him. That's great. <laughs> Excellent. You, you can. Um, so, um, it's, it's worth doing and, um, there's all of the vegetation, which you can interact with and cause like the fill, fill bloom to close up on itself and oh, you can nice. feed the shell. Um, and of course there's one or two Kremlins running around in, in the base of the chasm. 
Um, but really, the primary characters are still the Bushendi and the Chasm Fiend, besides yourself stepping into Kaladin's shoes. That makes sense, given the scope of what you said. Right. Um, how long has this a uh, uh, how long has this been in development? So we started on this project actually be talking about this project in in February of 2016. Um, oh, and 2016? when 2000 I'm sorry, 2017. I know. I, <laughs> yeah, I know. That's I just wanted to yeah. make sure there. Great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I completely forgot that we're in 2018. I know. I, it's weird for me too. So um, we started talking about the this concept and idea in 2000 in February of 2017. Uh, we went through kind of an exploratory phase of of developing different possible concepts um, before deciding on the adaptation of putting you in Kaladin's shoes at the stage when he's trying to learn how to use the the stormlight. Cool. Uh, how experienced um, is the team with Roshar? Like, have you guys read the books? Is this the first that you've heard of it when you were approached initially? Um, so uh, some of our team was familiar with it before we started thinking about this project. Um, I personally became familiar with Brandon's work um, in the summer of 2016. And started reading it. Um, okay. Of course, as we went into the actual design and, and build of this, we read all of the books that were out on the Stormlight Archives. I I went on a, a mammoth um, Brandon reading binge mm -hmm. and basically read nothing but Brandon for about eight months. Um, and it was... A uh, combination of really trying to distill myself in, in instill myself in the world and his writing styles, and really getting to know the interconnections across the different worlds. Um, we weren't sure as we started development how much we would play on that and build into the actual experience, but it was important to really understand the connections um, and. Um, yeah, some of the, some members of the team, when when they heard we we're going to be doing a Cosmere, were just through the roof because they were were long term fans. That's really cool, actually. Yeah, how awesome would that be to get the, like to already be a fan of the series and then to get that news like, hey, guess who just contacted us? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're gonna we're gonna make a Stormlight thing. Yes, yeah. exactly. So, uh, so how did this project actually get started. Did you approach DMG? Did they approach you? Um, so we had initially been talking to DMG about being involved with our production studio um, when we were getting started. And one of the reasons why we were interested in DMG as, as a production partner was because of their extensive experience in, in Hollywood and, and worldwide producing in top tier films, but also knowing that they had recently invested in Brandon and in building out this world, um, it felt like a, pers a perfect kind of pairing of their or significant production experience and history, his worlds and universes, and what we wanted to do with narrative and interactive storytelling. Um, so it was, we had approached DMG initially about working with us as a production partner, um, but then internal discussions back and forth in terms of like the types of projects that we wanted to produce that led us to actually choosing to do The Way of Kings as the first one. Cool. How much uh, involvement has uh, Dragonsteel and Brandon had on this, if at all? Uh, what, yeah. What's it like working with them if they've had any input or anything? Yeah. So um, we've worked pretty closely with with Brandon and his team on this adaptation. Um, there's a lot of things that happen when you're doing adaptations that yeah. take a lot of time. So it wasn't like a day-to-day, everyday 
uh, interaction, but Brandon and his team were always there as we started to have questions about the lore and the world. Uh, we certainly worked closely with his team to make sure that um, it felt to him like we were capturing the spirit and the lore in the world, um, both from the writing standpoint and the adaptation standpoint to the look and feel and to the actual experience of being in it. Um, and I even, um, when we got to a, a good place with the experience, uh, personally took it up to his team um, and spent like the day with them for not only a, him and the Dragon Steam team, well, Steel team to experience it, but a lot of the people who he felt close to in terms of building out this world. Uh, so that was that was fantastic. Well, can can you tell us what what he thought? Well, like that that sounds very exciting. What, what did he think? Um, he liked it. He felt like we captured the lore, we captured the voice, and the thing that I was most concerned about was really capturing Syl, um, okay. right? Because she she's an important character in the books. She has this great blend of na naivete and wisdom, and I wanted to make sure that the way we portrayed her came across as having that that moments of discovery that she has in the books but in a way that that still gave her justice to like being the important part of your journey through the experience um and he was really happy with that so i was i was thrilled once we were able to to do and capture that awesome that's, yeah that's really exciting uh so what was your uh What's your favorite part of this versus probably the most challenging part? Ah, that's a good question. I mean, to be honest, my favorite part is watching people experience it. Uh, <laughs> that's a good answer. I yeah. mean, with VR, it's always an experience if people haven't used VR for the first time. Getting exactly. really immersed in something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but if I'm actually going to distill it down to like my personal favorite moment, it, it is that moment when you start wall walking and you realize that you've now got your own special definition of gravity and it's different from what's going on around you in the world. Um, it's a place that I actually anticipated people would spend a lot of time in the experience. Um, they actually don't. They tend to spend <laughs> a little bit of time with it, but pretty much everybody who's tried it has said that really felt magical and special. And for me, VR is about transporting people to new lands, to new worlds, and making them feel like it's something they couldn't have done in any other way. And so that wall walking moment really captures that. Yeah, I imagine the trailer does not do it justice. Like any 2D representation does not do VR justice at all. No, not at all. It's it's well worth taking the time to experience it and, and feel it in the headset, feel the story unfolding around you. So what do you think the fans would be most excited to see and experience? Because we're kind of a crazy bunch <laughs> yeah, crazy yeah, obsessive yeah. bunch a little bit a little bit yeah that's a good question i'm hoping there's a little bit of something for every one of the uh, the fans um the fact that you actually come face to face with a chasm fiend i think a lot of people are really going to enjoy um that may be the, the most um I personally find the magic of lashing just feels special and unique. And so I think fans are really going to enjoy that, even though it is different than the actual exact lore. Um, people like the chow. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's like it was one of those characters that we felt was important to just add a little bit more life. Again, even though Charles aren't normally wandering the bottom of chasms, we needed to give something that, that told you this was a deeper, broader law, lore. 
um, and people love interacting with them. So, does the chull have a name? Can we canonize one and put it on our wiki? That'd be great. Oh, That'd we haven't important. we haven't given him a name yet. Oh. So oh. I'll leave it up to the fans to come up with the best name for him. Oh, that's dangerous. <laughs> yeah. You're gonna have naming wars on the we'll 17th shard forum. We'll have a poll, yeah. Chully McChull exactly. face. Yeah. There we go. We nailed it. Nailed it. Yeah. Easy. So, yeah, I think blashing is actually the thing people blashing and wall walking um, are the things that people will be the most excited to see. Um, so, if you were to make another one of these in Roshar or on Roshar, rather, what part of the world would you want to capture next? Ah. Uh, there's so there's so many. That's such a hard question to actually answer. Um, I would love to go into Delinar's visions um, and really yeah. experience that. Um, there are so many great opportunities for or narrative and story advancement. Um, in there and just amazing visuals. Um, yeah, and you've would, already so, so you've already got the built-in of like being in a in an avatar's body. Right. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> exactly. I would love to give people the experience of being in Bridge Force training camp and war camp. Um, mostly because I feel like there's great opportunities to to explore and to create there. Um, I really want to teach people wind running. Uh, <laughs> so um, those are those are potentially the areas. Um, it would be amazing to bring some shard glades to life um, mm -hmm. and to have people yeah. experience that. Um, that actually speaks to another interesting place where we did have to to um, adapt a little bit. So obviously we all know Kaladin is a fantastic Spearsman and that's really what he, he was known for. Um, and we initially started with people actually doing weapons training in Spears and uh, using the spear to, to defend themselves against the Prashendi. And what we found is there are kind of two issues to consider. One is, does that weapon feel natural in VR? And when you have VR controllers, it's very difficult to get the mechanics of that feeling right and natural. And sure. so what we found is people felt a little bit clumsy using a spear in VR. So that combined with it started to give you an advantage against the Prashendi, that you had a longer range against them. It, it didn't give that same kind of sense of intensity when you had to fight and defend yourself as we wanted people to experience. It needed to feel visceral. Um, and so we ended up leaving you without a spear. You end up having to defend yourself against the Prashendi using just your your fists, just your, your wits, a little bit of lashing. Um, you can steal the Prashendi's weapons if you really want to and use those. Um, oh, okay, that's good. That, that's so, um, but that's a mechanic that we had to, you know, because of the nature of VR, let people use an interaction method of fighting the Prashendi that felt the most natural to them. Yeah, because obviously when you have those VR controllers, you're your hands are one-to-one -one in there. And right. so punching something is a lot more natural than having a spear. And yeah. if you're Kaladin with a spear, you want to yeah. feel really powerful with it, right? Yeah. Or else, and if you exactly. feel clumsy, then that's terrible in a different way. Right, exactly. Um, so um, maybe in a future experience, like if we do a location-based entertainment experience, something where we can actually provide people with a spear, then um, that'll be a worth it. I would say definitely when people try the experience, make sure they've got a little bit of wall clearance. We've seen a lot of walls get punched as we've been <laughs> testing the experience. Um, 
I've only been hit three times, but... Oh, okay. Just three. That's, that's not too bad. <laughs> yeah. That's my own fault for not ducking out of the player's way. <laughs> that, that... You, you, well, you have to stand back when people it, are playing VR. You're, yeah. just, you're just enhancing their experience with tactile feedback. That's right. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so oh, if you, gosh. So if you could choose one of Brendan's other worlds to do a VR experience, which would you do? Uh, I mean, I have three personal favorites that I would love to do. Uh, one, one is Emperor's Soul. Um, I love the world. I love the strong female lead. I love the opportunity for discovery, for puzzle making. Um, and the idea that it is a single character who's been locked in a room and has to figure out how to you know, escape or, or not, or help, um, would be a tremendous opportunity to explore and yeah. develop. Um, so an escape room, really, in, in some yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, with amazing magic and, and amazing, and this idea of forgeries is just so fantastic or what you could do with VR. Um, so that's one of the ones I would love to do with Mistborn. I feel like mm -hmm. Mistborn has, again, it's got with the the elementcy and the ability to, to use um, the coins to, to transport yourself, you could really see that mechanic working well in VR and the, and the characters are just so strong in it. I mean, really what what drives any of our decisions are the characters and the, the relationship you can build with them. Um, just from a visual perspective, I really love Shadow. I, I always have trouble saying this full There's name. There's a lot of ones with shadows in the name. Yeah. So yes. Yeah. Shadows, shadows of Silence and the Forests of Hell. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. I, I think yeah. is... Again, it's a really interesting, beautiful visual world yes. uh, with characters that unfold in a re really unique and special way. Um, that one's a little bit more challenging to think about how you would adapt to VR. Um, that would but, be one of those where if you were just a walking simulator, I'd be super cool with it because mm -hmm. like, that's, that's actually just a haunting world and that's right. awesome. Exactly. So those are those are kind of my top three at the moment. Uh, I I'm going to continue to explore his worlds and think about it more. Awesome. That's so exciting. So you have this huge, amazing history of working on movies that the, all of us here and probably a lot of us yeah. listening basically grew up with. What's it like working on a movie and transporting to somebody into the world that way versus VR, where the players actually basically touch the world? Mm -hmm. You know, it's a really great question. And actually, when I started to go down the journey uh, of VR and something that uh, I was going to explore, a lot of my friends kind of said, what in the world are you doing? You've spent your entire career learning how to build frames, to direct <laughs> the, the viewer's eye on a frame-by-frame -frame basis yeah. to tell a story, and you're going to do something where you abandon that um, and let people have free roaming. Um, but visual storytelling, compositional design, as you think about the process of building films, is very similar to the VR process of building worlds. It's all about getting the viewer to engage and follow the story in the way that you want. Um, what's really different is we have this great opportunity to add interaction, to add the ability to discover. So this is a long way of saying there's a lot of similarities to the process. You really try to you know, boil the, the world and the story down to its core essence. What are the hero, the main themes? In the case of The Way of Kings, we felt like the important aspect was the hero's journey and Kaladin discovering that he's got more powers than he had thought possible and learning how to use those. Um, 
But then with VR, the difference is the a world can adapt and evolve with the viewer. There's interactivity. And so you have to think about the, the space you give people to explore and when and how. Um, there's a couple of things from a VR perspective that we kept as kind of our central design tenants, which is it must feel natural for the user or player or viewer uh, to discover their interactions. So um, if something was too hard to discover, if people were having trouble figuring it out, we needed to really think about how the story evolved to enable that better for them. The other thing that's really important to keep in mind is that in VR, the amount of information that a player or a viewer is taking in at any one stage is significantly larger than in a film. They can be choosing to look behind them, they can be choosing sure. to look around them. And so it required being even more careful about distilling down to the essence and motivation for why we were doing things and evolving and this story along the way. Um, so I'm speaking in generalizations because people haven't no, seen the experience. I'm, I'm um, yeah. But um, so that was kind of the, the, the biggest challenge. Uh, what we found is that we spent a lot of time actually like reducing elements, pairing elements back because we we're trying to give too much information to people all at once. Um, and they weren't getting the gist of the story. They weren't really experiencing the world. Uh, what we're really happy with is it's basically free roaming. It expands and contracts to, to the viewer. Sill does a great job of like keeping you kind of on task. Um, so if you, you really want to go down the alley, we don't want you to go down. She'll, she'll come along and say, we really want to go over here. Um, and that's a unique opportunity in VR, right? Is that you can let people explore but you can also have the characters react to them and, and bring you back into the main thread of the story. So did that, did that answer your question? Is there? I think so. Great. <laughs> God, it's so cool. <laughs> it's, it's, this sounds really cool. Because uh, mm -hmm. I, I, none of us, we, we don't have a VR thing. We don't have a Vive. And mm -hmm. they're, they're a little expensive. Uh, as it happens, but it, it sounds awesome. They, they are, but when you actually get to walk around in the world yeah. and like bend down and pick things up um, and interact with them, it becomes rapidly apparent why, why it's such a great medium for worlds like this. Any, any advice for people who have concerns with motion sickness? Uh, we did our best to really minimize the amount of motion sickness. Um, so far, we, we've also tested with a range of people, including people who we know are very susceptible to motion sickness. So we believe it won't be a concern for people. Um, there are a couple of things that are more like generalized VR advice for people who don't do a lot of VR, which is... Motion sickness in VR is cumulative, right? So it's like the longer you do it, it kind of adds up and it can get to a tipping point. Um, mm -hmm. So if you're starting to get motion sick, just pause for a moment. Don't teleport around too much. Just kind of give yourself a, a little bit of a clearing time. But that said, We've tried really hard to make sure that people don't get motion sickness. So there's things like when you teleport, we balanced the distance you can teleport, the speed you move, how the visuals are changing so that it doesn't impact you too much. Um, wall walking was something that when we initially were thinking about possible experiences to build, we'd actually thought, this would be a great focus point, right? We could build a whole experience around wall walking. 
Um, and we actually found that that was too much. Like we did some prototypes and like one wall walk was good. Two walks was, was good. Five was like so-so. And if somebody did like seven or eight of them, then they were done for the day. And so we really uh, kept it to just the crucial moment. And it feels magical and special um, without the well, yeah, and it doesn't make you motion sick. Like we, right. we, we have just the right amount of transitions. But like if your whole, it, if you imagine, for example, the assassin in white during the whole hallway battle, that would have made everybody motion sick. Um, and so we, yeah. we couldn't have done that. Um, that was a long way of saying, we're really hoping you won't get motion sick. We did our best to ensure that you don't, um, but if you do, just take a small breather, um, steady yourself, get your bearings, and you'll be fine. Uh, motion sickness is one of those things in uh, VR that until you create an experience, it's like, ah, yes, VR, right. you can do anything. Ah, we really don't want to make everyone sick, so we have to design around that just because exactly. that's how it works. And maybe don't punch anyone. Yeah, that that too. Um, yeah. But uh, I believe teleport mechanics are generally used in VR to minimize motion sickness as well, in some respects, with your movement. Because right, a, a lot of the teleport mechanics are actually to expand the space and the boundaries oh, okay. of where you can explore. Um, but there are tricks that you you pull to make teleportation work in a way that doesn't create you mo create motion sickness. So okay. you can literally just transport somebody to a new spot. Generally, that doesn't cause motion sickness. We felt like that actually also would tend to like take you out of the world a little bit. It starts right. to feel a little bit too much like um, mechanics as opposed to magic. Um, and so we chose to actually, when you teleport to, to something, have it sort of pull you at a rapid speed into that location. But we do things like we soften the edges a little bit and we tuned the amount of time that you travel to ensure that it doesn't make you motion sick. So if you were on Roshar and were in the process of becoming a Knight's Radiant, mm -hmm. what order do you think you would be? I actually don't know. You said <laughs> uh, you really something. liked wind running. I know. I, and wind running is my natural answer. Um, the idea of like that ability to transport yourself and see the world from a completely new perspective that you can't in any other way. Um, so, yeah, actually, a wind runner would be my answer. Light weaving is all about creation, though, creating that illusion, though. So it's, it's kind of like that, too. It, it is. Um, but I like to be able to move and explore. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, OK, here, here's a really silly one for you. Would you rather fight 100 duck-sized chasm fiends or one chasm fiend-sized duck and can we see this in VR? <laughs> um, I would rather fight one chasm fiend sized duck, although I think I'd like really? it my pet. Uh, mm. I feel like 100 duck sized chasm fiends would be a little bit overwhelming. Uh, yeah. And also for those people who have insect phobias, yeah. my. Yeah like really um trip them out and the thing that i love about the chasm fiend i love about seeing him in vr is scale and scope and we've seen a lot of vr experiences that make you a giant in a dollhouse world sure. but you don't get a lot of times and moments where you have a 30 foot plus creature looming over you and snapping at you with his claws um and so the same would hold true for a giant duck right a, a, 40 <laughs> foot, a, four, a 40 foot tall duck would be pretty awesome to see and experience 
Uh, ducks for our tourists. Yeah. Duck, uh, you fighting against giant ducks. Yeah. And it is, it's, it's actually interesting when, sorry to like talk about the Go VR for experience for a moment. Please do. Please do. We had to make some hard decisions about the scale of the chasm feed. Um, so in 2D, he actually looks relatively small compared to the Bershendi, right? Like kind Lore, of does, actually, yeah. The lore has him a lot bigger than that. Um, but when you're in a VR headset and you've got something that's 30 feet tall looming over you, you really don't want to be larger than that. Um, or people should enjoy this experience, even as they're fighting for their lives to, to get out of it. Um, so he doesn't feel small in VR. Um, and so that was our that was our, our our choice point of like let's let's prototype them at different scales, make them as big as we can to make people feel daunted and scared, but small enough that they feel like it's still something that they can overcome. Because at the end of the day, you need to to feel like you can make a difference in this world. Yeah, this isn't Dark Souls where you fail for two hours, right? And <laughs> move on from that yeah exactly or have your player jump off the chasm to get away from it <laughs> smack into the coffee table or something I'm, I'm lashing out of here i'm out yeah exactly um so uh what did you think of oathbringer it's a new so oh uh, it's really good i'm actually only about a quarter of the way through because oh. as you know with uh our experience coming out in a couple of weeks, a lot of my focus has been 100% on all of the final details of this. How so, dare you? I know. How dare you? <laughs> but like, I'm not going to work anything from Oathbringer into this experience, so let me wait until I can really enjoy it um, and, and dive into it fully. Um, so far, I'm really enjoying it, Yeah, but I haven't gotten all the way through it. I hear it's a big book. I don't know. I, I just heard that. I don't know. Just a little. Yeah. Uh, not as not as short as the Way of Kings, or um... yeah, he's just the, the light fare of Way of Kings. You know, right. you know, a bit of light reading. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think I was at uh, I was at one of Brandon's book signings, and he mentioned that like he's basically been restricted to the number of pages he can do based yep. upon what physically can be printed in a book. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So. They, they had to thin the pages yeah. uh, and make the font slightly smaller to fit it all in. Yeah. Cause when words of radiance came out, they were like, this is it. We cannot physically publish a bigger yep. book. And then yep. Oathbringer came out and it's a bigger book. Thinner pages. though. It's, it's yeah. actually thinner. <laughs> What, what if we have a 30-foot-tall Oathbringer that you just use Oathbringer? No, you, you, you wield Oathbringer against the Parshendi as a club. Easy. <laughs> Nailed it. But yeah. which Oathbringer? Ah. Oh, I was thinking the actual text. Yeah. That would be good. You're going to see some weird mods the on, the, on the Steam Workshop, thanks to us. Yeah, I... Uh, you know, hopefully people will love it and they'll embrace it and they'll they'll dive in and like think about what could be next. I wish there was a way to like rent a VR headset for a bit mm -hmm. than spending six hundred dollars on it. You yeah. Know? Um there Whatever aren't th there are a few rental services in like San Francisco and LA. Um yeah. but um, unfortunately, that's not easy um, no. everywhere in the world. Um, we would love to bring the experience to location-based entertainment centers so people without VR could experience it. That makes sense. Um, the challenge for us is that we really wanted to create something that people could explore. And yeah. uh, so right now it's at a little bit of a longer length than location-based centers like to have. Um, but I certainly encourage people to go to their local oh, VR center and ask for it um, because we can, we're certainly going to work to try to make it as accessible to people as possible. 
it's a really new medium. Yeah. Really new. And it's very interesting that, yeah, this is actually a little too long, actually. Mm-hmm. So, so some fans were like, oh, it's, it's really short, but yeah. it actually would be too long for, like, waiting in line for everyone to spend 15 to 30 minutes on it. Exactly. So, but um, I'm sure there are friends out there that have VR headsets. Um, and there is like a, a, a Steam VR group on Facebook. People could go and like, if they don't have a, a headset themselves, ask around. Maybe there'll be someone else who'd be willing to share. Um, um, any thoughts on the mobile-based VR systems like Google Cardboard and stuff like that? Um, for this particular experience, we're not going to be releasing it on mobile. Uh, we really try to capture a deep, broad world, and it's just too big um, mm-hmm. for that. The the compute power of the phones don't sure. support that. Uh, continuing to look and think about it uh, a lot. Um, I love mobile VR or like the the Daydream, the Gear VR. Just is a great way for people to experience worlds but they are definitely better for more passive experiences Mm. Um, and in this case we really wanted to capture the interaction plus plus narrative Mm -hmm. definitely and and vr is very computationally expensive so yes um so for now it's limited to desktop based solutions do you have any questions for us I was actually, I was wondering, and like to to turn the question on its, its head, what is the what is the part of the Way of Kings and the Stormlight Archives that you would most like to see in VR? Ooh. I want to see the Palinaeum. Mm-hmm. I want to explore that. Yeah. Um, Erythero would be cool, too. When you were mentioning the visions, I was just imagining the first Dalinar vision where you're uh, against the Midnight Essence. That mm-hmm. fight, yeah. that one would be really good. Yeah. I would probably go with Erythero. Like, just yeah. coming out of the Oath Gate and mm-hmm. seeing that. Yeah. But Dalinar's visions, that's a really cool idea. Mm-hmm. That I, I think would be really cool. Oh, watching oh. the recreants in VR. Oh, that'd be that would be pretty soul crushing. <laughs> that'd be good. There yeah. is one, but that's a little spoilery, so I won't mention it. Yeah, you got he gotta read and find out. Yep. Oh, yeah. You gotta <laughs> you gotta raffo. That yeah. one would that would that would be amazing though. I think I, I know I think I know the one you're thinking about. Okay. But right. So that's yeah. actually an Oathbringer? Yeah. That's okay. a good ringer. It's really good. The ending's oh. really good. In a couple of weeks, I'll I'll be a clear and free to read again. Yeah, so, you'll 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 yeah. get a time to breathe again. Yeah. 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 I feel like the visions would be really fun for like an active interact with the story, and then mm-hmm. like the location ones, like Urethiru and Palinaeum. You're just walking around looking at all the pretty because yeah. this world is extremely pretty. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly very visual that's that's the best thing about stormlight is we get the actual visuals in the book yeah the art exactly cool yeah i think those are my big questions uh you know i really appreciate your your time um it's been a great conversation yeah Yeah. thank you so much for coming on with us so um we are a real podcast now we're a real (laughs) podcast i guess (laughs) Uh, I'm pretty sure you were a real podcast before, but yeah. But then we we get uh, actual guests rather than <laughs> hey yo, uh, can we can we get you on the podcast this weekend? I don't know. I'm really busy. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's nice. Good. Well, it's been a pleasure talking with you guys, and it's like the the rhythm and discussion was fun. Yeah. And I really can't wait for people to see the experience hopefully be able to check it out soon. Have to bug my friends and see if I can find anyone with a headset. I'm in the middle of nowhere, so that will not be possible for me. So, uh, you, you said you teach at a university, right? 
Yeah, but my town that I'm in is 36,000 people. The university is a third of that. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, probably someone has it, but yeah. Yeah, so someone has to. Probably. Yeah. Start offering extra credit to your students. <laughs> like, hey, if you have a VR headset, it'll let me use get, it for this. Bring me a Vive. Just, I'll just need it for a day. I'll get it back to you. Nothing will go wrong. And get, get some points. I'm sure that won't get me in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Next week, we will be back with a normal episode. Uh, you can follow us at 17chart.com on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, and YouTube, all at slash 17th Shard. Um, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for coming Bye. on. Bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you.